Before we begin, we'd like to say that, in our opinion, it is not suitable for children or for those of you who may have a nervous disposition. Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast. And today we've got a bit of a treat for you. It's a bit of a Halloween special. So, um, you sound super excited. I know, because I am, because I love this movie. We've delved the archives and gone into the depths of the streaming services, and we have found that absolute gem for you today. We basically looked for something that was going to be crap, but we were sorely disappointed. We really were. The The trailer looked, it looked going to be dreadful. You know, it had like a really sort of clickbaity poster with a, a gas mask or loads of worms in it. And then we watched it and we were like, oh. Yeah, the trailer the trailer made me think, this is going to be great. We're going to have so much material to like... No, rip. We're going to riff on it, weren't but, we, for like an hour and a half. Yeah, honestly, like the premise, the, you know, the production looked good, but the premise looked a bit ropey. And then some of the visual effects were like, that's, that's a bit, that's yeah. going to be a bit naff. But you know what? Pleasantly surprised. Anyway, yeah, so it what, are we, what, are we, what are we going to be discussing, Robbie? So the film is called Trench Eleven. Um, but then when we click play, it said it was Death Trench. So yes, we're not sure, basically. And it was released in 2017, directed by Leo Sherman. And it's a Canadian film, which is rare. You don't see many Canadian movies. Yeah, that's true. Um, you don't see many Canadian films. And it's, it's the plot. It's a little bit cliched. Very, you know, there's this bunker and there's sort of spooky goings on in there. The, the British military decide we need to go and find out what's happening. Well, the the trailer kind of makes it like a zombie film. I was expecting zombie Germans. Yeah, I thought that these days. You know, you get a bunch of lads in grey uniforms and you make them zombies and you make your movie. Yeah, but spoilers, they weren't zombies. Yeah, they weren't zombies, but they were zombies at the same time. Yeah. It's really confusing. But then again, they don't play a massive part in the film. No, they really don't. <laughs> Which is really surprising. I think the, the main sort of allies are more dangerous to themselves than possibly the enemies. Yes. So... They find this bunker, they're like, oh, there's all dodgy dealings going on down there. We need to go and find out and possibly destroy it. And then lo and behold, the Germans doing the exact same thing at the same time. Yeah, well, exactly. So really, one of the first things I thought was this shouldn't be called Death Trench or Trench 11. This should be like Bunker 11. Definitely. But I suppose they were going for like the World War One link, make it super obvious. You know, and there's a film called Death Watch as well. So maybe they're trying to riff off that. Maybe. But it's a weird kind of... It does, it's, there's no trench in it though. They're in a trench for like five minutes. Yeah, but it's not a bad trench. Beautiful trench. It's a very clean trench, except for the bodies, but you know. And the, the blood on the floor and the, the, the dead German pile of dead Germans with like the dog. Yeah, and one dead wolf. It's weird. Which is, isn't it? What was the, why was the, and we never find out why the wolf was there. No, we don't. I mean, I assume it just looks scary. Yeah. I don't know. Keeps you guessing. We're not going to talk about the cast because there's no big name actors to really riff on. Or anything. No, there's a Sutherland in there, but that's about it. Rossif Sutherland, the guy is... That's the one. The acting wasn't bad. The acting wasn't terrible. No, it wasn't awful. I mean, he has the thickest New York accent you've ever heard. Yeah, bizarrely un-Canadian. It's so weird. He says he's from Winnipeg. Yes. And he's meant to be Canadian, but he talks like he's a New York cab driver the whole movie. It's so odd. So we, we've got we've got a, rag, a ragtag patrol consisting of a Canadian doctor. Oh, no, that... that... That doctor's British. Is he? Is he supposed to be British? I thought he was Canadian. Yeah, he's British. Okay, so we've got we've got British intelligence doctor and major. That's it. Canadian tunneler and then an American escort. Because they're on the they're in the Argonne region, aren't they? So that, in that time it was it was American troops there, which makes sense. It was an American sector, so but they're so cliched. It's, those Americans. Yeah, they really are. And they're sitting around smoking cigars, wearing like wearing rifle belts as bandoliers, big. Furry yeah. coats. I mean, the prop department were loving it, but but I was just cringing. It just looked a bit. Oh God! But at least, at least the weapons detail and the uniforms went anachronistic. They no, weren't terrible. No, we were fully expecting like air rifles or something. You know, we weren't. Yeah, we weren't expecting actual good armory 
or, or, or a good armor to be associated with the movie. No, which is odd. like when we watched the trailer, we, I, I thought, why are these Canadians? Why have these Canadians got 1903 Springfields? And then only until like we actually looked up this like the synopsis of the film and watched it, we realized, oh, yeah, Yanks, they have an American escort. Okay, it's kind of weird. It because. Americans in World War One films kind of there isn't a massive amount of them in World War One films. You've got Lost Battalion, and that's about it. That's a great film. Yeah, then, which is a good movie. There's not that many, yeah. so to see American First World War soldiers on film, I think it's a bit jarring for a British audience. For, for me or you, really, maybe. Perhaps so. I mean, yeah, it's true that there aren't a lot of recent American films that deal with it. That's for sure. I'm not really hundred percent on American kit. It didn't look bad. No, I'm not either, and. They, did, they didn't look like there was anything that was World War II era that had been repurposed. The tunics looked correct. Mm. Um, the weapons certainly looked at a glance. You don't really get to see them up close too much. No, you don't. Which is makes it a little bit tricky, but they look like the correct mark of of, of uh, 1903. Yeah, Springfield. Um, the other weapon they have, which is quite interesting, was a Winchester 1897 trench gun. Yep. They were never Which actually called trench guns. That's a that's a post war thing. But they had a oh okay. They had a um the correct looking version of the, the trench gun. Mm. And you you know your your big macho man at the front carrying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your main macho yeah. American character was you know very much point man with his with his shotgun. Oh god, yeah. But and then they all do that thing in modern movies where they point the gun on the floor like they're holding a carbine. Yeah, they all have them all at low ready. Ugh. Rather than does my head than, in like port arms, which is kind of annoying. It's so annoying. It's the armourer's fault, I always say, because they're training them in weapon safety. Yes. And that's a safe way to handle a weapon. So And it might also be something that they have to do. Like the armourer might not allow them to to port arms. Right, yeah, possibly. For safety reasons. I Yeah, yeah. Because I've done firearms training. Like, this is years ago now, but I was training how to use an AK and the guy teaching me was like, you know, finger off the trigger, point the floor. So yeah, it's, it's standard. I can see why you do it. It's safe, isn't it? Yeah. But it just jars me in historical films, you know. It's not correct historical weapon handling, obviously. But, you know, if the insurance demands it, then I guess a, a low budget film, would, you would have to do it. But, you know, you see it in big films too. Definitely. But yeah, so that was, that was interesting that we saw uh, an 1897. Um, 1897s were definitely used, probably not as much as people think they were. They were definitely used um, as a patrol weapon, yeah. but again, not in the numbers that people think they were. So correct, but quite a surprise. You know, on our, our sort of, on our list of things we thought were going to be wrong, you know, proper weapons were, were quite high on the list. What else do we see? We see um, the interesting use of um, torches, flashlights. Yeah, pound shop torches, yeah. But they 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 looked like the the tube metal yeah they look and yeah. the box metal they ones they looked accurate they enough looked good enough they? I'm definitely not yeah. uh, a World War One era Edwardian torch, torch expert, expert. We, yeah. perhaps we should get uh, an Edwardian torch expert on in the future if you are a torch expert we we'd love to have you on if you're listening trenches and torches the brand new podcast oh god we're spinning off already. From my opinion, Sartis were dreadful, but I expect it. I mean, parties are difficult to do um, from my own experience. <laughs> yeah. And some of the great coats definitely weren't First World War great coats. They might have been from the local Target or Costco. Mm. They were a bit iffy, but it looked all yeah. right. <laughs> There's a briefing early on, isn't there, as well, of some British officers where it's a little bit questionable, some of the uniform, the major yeah, he's very clipped. He's very like cliche British yes, officer who's very, very on mission all the way through. But like his badges, what the hell are his badges on his lapels? What the hell are they? I don't know. I've 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 trolled some uh, pages of of badges of World War One unit badges, and I've got nothing. I have no idea. They just I've looked the depths, and I can't find out. We never get a clear look yeah. at them. But you know what really annoyed me is they wore their unit badges and their rank out on the patrol which is something that i don't think was done i'm not sure i mean especially not that time in the war no you know i know that officers were going into into battle with rifles and, and battle dress if they could or no rank yeah. at all yeah. um so exactly. obviously sniper you know what an officer looks like but yeah we we, we ended up saying that his badges was british army transport corps 
when we were when we were watching it, it's me and Matt watched this live together. Three hundred miles. <laughs> That's it. Three hundred mile distance over the internet. Yeah, but it was just like a running joke. Like, and he pulls a pistol on someone halfway through the movie. And it went really quiet. And I was just like, this is not how we do things in the British Army transport car. <laughs> <laughs> we just came to the conclusion it's probably the prop departments don't know what they've got. Yeah. But- and I think one thing that stood out to me in that scene was the material the uniforms are made out of doesn't look like serge or anything yeah. that would have been no. used. It just looks like it- nice sort of new wool. Yeah, it, it looks like almost polyester in, in places. Yeah, the Americans look like they've got velour on at times, but I think that might be the grading. I'm not sure. Yeah, that might be a, an element of it. We're also wondering about all the medals that the, there's a briefing and, a, and there's a there's a colonel. Yeah. Um, who is Ashcroft, you know, Colonel Ashcroft? Ah, oh, there we go. And he's sort of like, "What's going on? Why? Why is this trench? Why are they digging it so deep? <laughs> yes, this hundred foot deep. Yeah. Why are they trying to avoid our shell fire? It's like, <laughs> obviously, why? Like the like the Germans aren't known for digging bunkers. Yeah. Oh no, they never dug one in their life on the Western yeah. Front. This is a completely new endeavor. But we were wondering what is what is he's wearing um quite an accurate jacket. Yeah. It's not too bad. The material doesn't look quite right, like I said, but I mean he's packed into it, bless him. You know, he's got his Sam Brown belt on, yeah, and he's got his red staff tabs. Yeah, yeah. And he has like a little um strip of medals, uh, his medal yeah. tapes on. Yeah. And I was wondering, I wonder what they are. So and I'm not a medal expert, so I threw it, I threw it out on uh, Twitter at historic firearm. Quick plug. Um and that- uh, fight, at fighting on film as well <laughs> for our own yeah do plug the podcast Robbie yeah definitely <laughs> I'll keep doing it don't worry and <laughs> um, we got some good responses um, and it turns out uh, possibly has the DSO India Service Medal um, and a couple of South African medals and possibly the Ashanti Medal so he's gotten around and he's got around yeah you know yeah. Trench 11 don't know what hit it you know Boer War veterans he's uh, yeah but the Major hasn't got any medals though has he they duck and dive in the transport corps you know <laughs> He could, he could strip a bed for QL engine, but he, he don't know what's done on the front line. This was his like chance to prove himself, wasn't he? It was. I think he wanted that. Um, he wanted those extra pips. He wanted to be a colonel, didn't he? He did. You know, out the ladder a bit, and that was the the weird part of the movie. Isn't it? They they all start blaming him for him to be like promoted. Yeah, the, it's weird. All the all the characters that don't know each other seem to know an awful lot yeah. about one another. Like the Americans, they know all about the major. They know that he wants he wants to be a colonel, and he's you know yeah. he's going to be gung ho for the mission. And they know about the Canadian tunneler who was trapped underground for eleven days before he was found. He he dug his way out. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what they were like. He's just like. Yeah. How how do you know this? You're, you're in a completely different sector. They had a, they had a dossier of orders or something. Yeah, they had an absolute fat, fat file of stuff to read. It was weird. It's so bizarre. So bizarre. Twenty minutes in, we've had no horror. No. Not at all. It's a standard war movie fair, isn't it? We we had a, we have a little bit of exposition with the the meeting and then the briefing rather, and then we're introduced to the the tunneler character and his French girlfriend who he wants to take to Winnipeg. It's so stupid. And, he, and there's a scene where he, he sort of like <laughs> he sort of like describes <laughs> Winnipeg great as detail. more beautiful yeah, than yeah. Paris. <laughs> I'm gonna take you to Winnipeg. <laughs> Can't, can't wait to take you back to Winnipeg. It's just and she's like, like yeah. she's like really doing a great job of hiding her excitement. Oh to no, go she, to she, she couldn't contain her excitement. You know, it's like so weird. Um, but no, I did some, and then just quickly, I did some research, and the, the film was shot in Winnipeg. Naturally, so maybe it was just like a little kickback for the for, for the Winnipeg council i don't yeah, think i've never council in winnipeg yeah, I mean, i've never been to winnipeg but i know that the area is quite pretty so you know you know and then winnipeg rifles heritage there yeah exactly there's heritage you know missed a trick in the movie they could have been they could have been from that regiment couldn't they it would have been easy definitely and then there's some exposition from the americans where they're like marching along yeah yeah and we're introduced to all these American characters. Yeah. They know everything. They literally know everything. <laughs> they do. It's crazy how much they know. These three random AEF guys just know everything. Why only three? <laughs> that, such a I weird escort. Understand that. So you have a nervous. You have you have the tropes of a nervous guy, mm-hmm. a weary lieutenant. Yeah. And the butch, the butch gung ho like private or sergeant or whatever it was. 
And he, you know, he's got like all his kit hanging off him, you know, like it's yeah, he's got grenades hanging off his webbing. He's like Rambo, isn't he? World War One Rambo. So they get into the bunker finally. Yes, about twenty minutes in, they finally like, get to the trench. Uh, yeah, and it's all like deserted and scary, and like there's blood on the walls and whatever. They're like, why did they leave so so, so quickly? So soon, yeah. And then they cut to like the German baddies. Stereotypical like villain slash pseudo Nazi. It turns out, and like the British were like, oh, this really like he's chewing the scenery, isn't he? Like proper proper pseudo Nazi. You know, it's like they. I don't know why they just didn't make a second World War movie because it would have sort of tied in better. I think their plot would have tied in better to a second World War setting. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see this. It would easily be done as, as a... Mm. Maybe, they, maybe they felt it had been done too much. Maybe. And perhaps they wanted to capitalise because it was made in 2017. So maybe they wanted to capitalise on on the on the centenary. Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, I didn't think like, about that. You know, this is, it's 100 years since World War One ended. Here's a World War One horror film. Hey. Because nothing says remembrance no, like yeah. a World War One horror film. <laughs> exactly. <film. laughs> Wear your World War One horror film with pride. That's what they said. There's an interesting scene where the Americans um, sort of get themselves ready by shotgunning like oh yeah pills. Yeah, they like these little tic tac looking things, don't they? Yeah, and you know they have this weird sort of like brief like frenzied high mm. and. The, the the British major turns to the doctor and he's like, what are they taking? And he's like, oh, it's cocaine. Like concentrated cocaine. So I was, I was like, I, I know cocaine was was a thing during the war. Um, so I did a, a little bit of research after watching that and I wondered like how accurate a portrayal it was. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it turns out that while co- like cocaine was definitely a thing, it was freely available up until about 1916. God. In the shops. You could get it from shops and pharmacies. Mm. Uh, in in the UK, we had something called uh, forced march, and another another um, tablet form is called tabloid. Oh wow! Okay. And so the, there was brands of Coke pills that you could mm. get, and apparently people were sending them to like people at the front or like handing them to Tommy's going off to the front at train stations. You know, loved ones were like it, there were adverts for like loved ones to send out. Um, okay. Oh, Johnny, please don't get killed. Don't get killed. Here's, here's, here's some, some cocaine. cocaine. <laughs> so, so weird. Yeah. Um, but in about 1916, there was a big panic around like uh, abuse of, of cocaine uh, that was whipped up by the papers. And there was a great cocaine um, crisis, apparently. And the, the Defense of the Realm Act was amended to make the sale of it illegal. Wow. I never knew um, that. That's- that's crazy. So you can directly pinpoint the classation of cocaine to the First World yeah, War. Yeah, you can is, pinpoint that's, the, t- the. That's a great fact. Exactly, I love that. It's it's mm. amazing. So these guys are shotgunning cocaine tablets, and they're taking a lot. They're taking more than they should be. They should be like, it's one every now and then, not like down in the bottle. I mean, Tony Montana would be like, "Calm down, lads. It's too much." Yeah, that it's 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 very excessive. Mm. But the, the the most ironic thing about that. The American army at the time was a dry army. There were there, there was no booze issued. Wow! And it was directly prohibited for for servicemen to like drink. So it's a weird plot point. It really is. It's 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 kind of like a, it's a weirdly anti-American plot point. It's, it's sort odd, of like a it? criticism. Yeah. Like the British and Canadian ca- characters are like sort of like looking on, like oh that's shocking. Oh my! Good lord! What are they, what are they doing that for? Yeah. And the, the the doctor sort of says it's like it aids battle fatigue, and that is what it was advertised mm. to do. So mm. someone had obviously done some research and, and found out about cocaine use. Definitely. Uh, obviously, we 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 associate amphetamine use with World War Two. Yeah. And but cocaine was the big drug for World War One, which mm. was really interesting. Well, this because um, it's weird though in the movie that never comes up again. They do it. No, that's what and I was going to say. So they have this weird, like, frenzied high. <laughs> yeah. And then it's never, you, it's never like, yeah. alluded to or or is a plot point. It's so odd because you think, oh, are they going to, like, obviously it's a zombie, well, zombie film, quote unquote, but are they going to use it to, like, overpower the zombies with, like, cocaine power? It's, like, stupid, but, like, yeah. what's the point in it? No one knows. I don't know. No. But then, yeah, they're, they're in this bunker and they finally, like, looking around and they're like, we're trying to work out what's on the other side of this wall and it goes all quiet and some like mad lad comes out of nowhere and he's just like gibberish in german and he's got his kind of like german uniform on and they're like 
what's this guy doing? What's this guy saying? You know, like getting all upset and stuff like him. And he won't <laughs> shut up. And the, the the guy with the shotgun's like, if you don't tell him to like be quiet, sir, I'm going to shoot him. And we're like, what? why? <laughs> he's clearly not a combatant at this point. You know, he's gone mad. No, he's clearly, he's clearly like panicked and he's not actually attacking him. But the guy starts like sort of like begging him to shoot him. Yeah, he's like, no, yeah. she, she said, she said, she said, shoot me, shoot me. And then he like, and then he does, pulls the, starts pulling the shotgun <laughs> at his, and then he <laughs> gets the shotgun round square in the, in the head. It's a great shot. And I was, I, you know, you want, that's the first sort of like element of horror we get, really, isn't it? And you, like, it's just great. Like, it, I don't know how they did it, but it's like a plastic head and it just explodes and goes everywhere. It's not even horror, is it? It's not. It's just gore. It's murder, isn't it? Really, it's just it's so bad. Pork. It was quite accurate, though. I mean, as a representation of what a shotgun would do to a to someone's skull. Oh, I mean, God, yeah. There's nothing left. It's, it's yeah. very gruesome. There's one hell of a headache. After that, you know, after that um, <laughs> little bit of Geneva Convention um, breaking, they just pop into the bunker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Commit a war crime. Oh, the doors open. Let's go. Okay, let's go in. Yeah. So they basically they go in and um, they start investigating. And the, the basic premise is they're looking for evidence of biological and chemical weapons de- being developed. That's it. Yeah. And it's sort of intimated that the British major wants to like take what's being developed back. Yeah, but they they, they say they don't even develop on that either. No. Because he doesn't even go like, oh, collect any blood samples we find and all that. It's not. It's not like alien levels like. But they're like, oh, we can weaponize it. It's just kind of alluded to. Yeah, it's just annoying, isn't it? Really, it's like plot points that just go nowhere in that movie. Yeah, the, there's a the lot time. of like things that you think are going to be important, important to the plot. Yeah, but then never sort of like mature or or, or turn into an, an yeah. element of their own. And, so and they, they, they basically yeah. they push through the bunker, don't they? Mm. And they they encounter it's like an infected man, an infected, not a zombie. But an infected, <laughs> and what and what happens? What happens to the poor chap that gets right. jumped? Yeah, he like he, it's, it's again. It's like another scene in the dark in this lady. I think he's it's alluded to that he might be naked. It's just weird. He comes out of nowhere, and he like piggybacks one of the lads, and they have a bit of a tussle, mm-hmm. and they end up on the and floor. And he like get, yeah, end up on the floor, and he like just like vomits in his face. It's like the most <laughs> like, sticky, phlegmy vomit yeah. you've ever seen. <laughs> you know, we were just like, oh, you need some Cavornia that lad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we were just like, what the fuck? And then and nothing happens. He cleans himself off and he walks off. He does. Like nothing happened. And, and we're it's, just like, what it's the a fuck? Good, it's a good like 30, 40 minutes into the film yeah. before anything comes of that. So that's like one of the few yeah. plot points that happen that then that's evolve. It. Oh, and he shoot he does shoot the, the zombie guy with a cult and he, he does do him in. Yeah. Yeah, they do kill. They do kill the zombie, um, and, and then after that, it cuts to like the, the Germans co-invade the bunker. Yeah, so the the pseudo Nazi sort of like doctor, the the guy Reiner, actually developing Reiner. Yeah, sort of like he's going there to to get his samples. Basically, yeah. he's not go, he's not going there to to That's do it. anything. He wants he's going to there to get his samples. Yeah, yeah. But the mission, the actual mission that they're supposed to be on it's they're supposed to be blowing the bunker up right because they evacuated previously but the bunker doesn't blow up mm-hmm. and they find out later that steiner didn't set the charges properly Ooh. Dun, 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 dun. Reiner. Who did Reiner. it on purpose it's not it's not steiner from das boot it's, it's reiner oh reiner sorry <laughs> oh, reiner. so then yeah we we get this great scene where that I think the, the British and the Canadian and the Americans start having this big tiff about why they're there. Yeah, they just randomly they? start infighting. Like they some of them want to get out proper, straight away yeah. and then some of them and, don't. No, there's just like clear insubordination like throughout the whole movie as well. You like, know, we keep talking about the movie as a whole, but like your privates don't respect the officers. No. <laughs> it's just like and you know, everyone and it, bar like three people are private. There's a very clear chain of command that is not being followed. So like, there's only there's only like Three private soldiers, and they don't just give a shit. They're just like, "Oh, I'm gonna do what I want. I don't care." And then the minute like an officer starts to like enforce any rules, they get all bullshit. Yeah, and, they like, pull, pull guns, guns on each like, other. Wow, like, okay. Like, so you end up like a, with a Mexican mm. standoff. Yeah, Jennings is not having it, is he? At which point, probably the best scene of the whole film occurs. Oh, it's yeah, 
it's enter, great. You... The, enter the German stormtroopers. Oh yeah, they're brilliant. Because of course they're stormtroopers. You know, gas masks. Gas masks. They've got like they have um, Sturmhelm. Yeah, and and they have British um, anti-splinter masks that were issued to World War One tank crews, which was very odd. I think the Germans had like their own version of that as well. They did, but I think they were definitely like a, 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 the British uh, anti-splinter masks. And they burst in, didn't they? And the they guy's did. got a, a Bergman machine yeah, gun. A Bergman MG15 NA, which is like the most obscure light machine gun of the German army of the period. It's rare, isn't it? Yeah, it's like really rare. It's like, so while the MG0815 is probably like the better known German light machine gun of World War One. These lads burst in with a, with a Bergman MG15 NA and literally hose the room down. <laughs> it obliterates everything, didn't he? It's, it's indiscriminate fire. It just kills everything. The poor major gets like his entire face shot in. <laughs> yeah, it just absolutely obliterates his head. And we get like another element of like... It's just schlock. Ballistic like gore. Schlocky gl- like gore in it, you know. Yeah. But it's, you've got to feel... You know, he's, he's basically pinned to a wall <laughs> and shot through yeah. by the, by the yeah. machine gun fire. All the time, like the sergeant, the Amer- the bullshit American sergeant, like is like there with his nineteen eleven. He just opens up, firing away at him, and he's got armor on, isn't he? That the German he has, he's got like like trench armor on, and it sort of like bounces off him. So the the only person that survives is the doctor and the um, American uh, doughboy who's just started coughing. He's he started coughing now, just to you know remind us all. Was that the one that got coughed on? Yeah, but he's also the one that got the little scar on it, the little, little cut on his chest. No, he's the one that he got did. it all like coughed on. Oh my god, really? Yeah. Oh, for God's sake! <laughs> Can't even keep up. I didn't care enough. I know that's the problem. <laughs> when you don't care, you just kind of just like they. And it's dark too. They all look the same. Yeah. Oh, the grading is weird. It is. And then after that, the stormtroopers leave, and you never see him again. No, you never. You never. The the best part of the film, the Bergman, you never see again. That must have been the most expensive gun it's gotta be. to use on set. So they, they only had that for a day. Yeah, I reckon. We, you know, actually, you never see any of those stormtroopers again. No, you don't. You see just like, you see like German guys in normal <laughs> uniform. Yeah, you see the world's oldest stormtrooper. It's like a 60-year-old stormtrooper like just, just going around with them. It's so jarring. So oh. they're all captured, except for... That's it. T- didn't tell on the man make it out. No, he doesn't, does he? He doesn't, no. They, he gets captured separately. They're kind of like they get they find a ladder out. That's it. And they and don't the bother going up it. <laughs> just look at the they look at the stars. No. They sort of like discuss whether they're gonna go back for everyone. And by the time they've decided that they are gonna go back for everyone. Oh my god. The, the, half of them are dead. Half of them are, yeah, half <laughs> they don't know that yet, but half of them are dead. And the Germans have surrounded them. <laughs> yeah. They 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 round it up and it turns out that mm. for some unknown reason that the German expedition's demolition guy has been killed. It. Um, yeah. By the by, the the infected that we only see once or twice. There's a scene with the tunneler and the um, the American lieutenant who basically takes the shotgun off the sergeant purely because they want to use that in the scene. Yeah. And there's a scene where they they open up a room and it's full of infected or zombies. They're not really zombies, but they're infected. They're kind of ravenous. Ravenous people that have vermicelli <laughs> coming out of them. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll get back to that in a second. Um, but there's a scene where, like, they open one of them up, and the oh god, yeah, we didn't we even didn't discuss even the that, autopsy. Did we? we were just so engrossed in the the decent weapon chat. Yeah, but, the, but initially they they get one of these infected people, and they open him up like proper old style, yeah. cranking his chest open, and then the, the doctor Sawing kind of, him up. Basically. That's it. They hack him up. <laughs> And the, the doctor pulls out which look which looks like a rice noodle and it's like jiggling about on his like um tweezers and he's like, This is a man made parasite. No one can catch Honestly, this disease. It looks like someone's dropped a bowl of noodles in him. It's just awful, isn't it? <laughs> we just So it turns out it turns out that the whole premise of the film is the Germans have have contracted uh, a very virulent strain of worms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which might endanger mankind as and somehow as, as that whole. makes you insane yeah. and and the the, do, the evil dr reiner people. says like oh some people kill some people go mad some people like you know just become really violent or whatever 
and it's just alluded that it's like going to be like this really horrible thing that everyone's going to catch and it'll, it'll destroy mankind. Yeah, but it, it, about three people have it, so I don't know why they're so concerned. <laughs> There's some really weird, like forced allusions to like the the Spanish flu pandemic, which yeah, was yeah. starting in 1918, which it's was ham, it ham fists and, a lot of. Theoretical yeah, stuff some, in there, and like there's, there is, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like historical events referenced, like the the blockading of, yeah, of Germany, yeah, is like referenced. The, the, which the is a surprising reference. Yeah, it's a good reference. You know, it is, but they but don't kind of, go into like it's surface any detail level. on why they reference that. But no, I think they were just trying he's, to. He's sort of comparing his actions with the actions of the Royal Navy. I think. Yeah, in the, saying like they're causing they're causing a famine and death. that's bad. Yeah, yeah. He's causing a, a worm based pandemic. It's not so as weird. Also bad. It's so weird. Know. Yeah, that that's like the whole infection, and then whenever you see like a zombie die, they've got like a little noodle going up their nose or coming out their <laughs> eye or something. It just looks shit. And we we proposed that the movie should have been called The Attack of the Vermicelli Jerry's. Honestly, I. I mean, I knew, I knew, I knew the effects were going to be a little bit ropey, but they were the worst. I think they spent all the money on the gore, the shotgun blast, and the it. It was gory, but it looked shit. Mm. And I think that was the problem. There was no middle ground there. Like you either have this like proper disgusting looking alien thing coming out of them, or, or you have rice noodles. Yeah. You know, what's cheaper, rice noodles, so that gets used. <laughs> And then we get the introduction of my favourite trope ever, which is the good German. Yes, yes. And so the other German officer um, that's that's tasked with destroying the bunker. I think it's called um, General Ophelus. Was he? According was to my know. sources, the IMDb page. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know. His name is irrelevant. Mr. Mr. Nice German. The good German. Mm-hmm. And... Basically, he wants to. He, he doesn't agree with what Reiner is doing. No. And he wants to blow up the bunker. So he enlists the That's help it. of the Canadian alcoholic tunneler. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's always got a drink in his hand, that boy. Um, isn't he? Christ. Who is he? He's obviously using alcohol dependency to deal oh, with yeah. his PTSD, clearly. Yes. Yeah. Um, so he basically, they go and find the giant um, pile of explosive. It's like loads of Amatol in it or something. Yeah. Basically. So I assume it would have been. Yeah. And he's like, everything's here. There's deck core, there's detonators, everything we yeah. need. And then he goes, he does this whole thing. He's like, what's missing? And he just like pulls up two bits of wire and just goes, Duh, like someone didn't put the wire <laughs> together. Exactly. And then, you know, they've not, they've not encountered any more undead. No, at all. Or infected. Yeah. And yeah. then out of nowhere, one comes in and sort of like breaks the German guy's ankle. He's got a big trench club, isn't he? And he just swings at him. And you, you, they do that lovely shot in these sort of movies where you get like a fake leg and it just comes away. Yeah. And it's just enough you have to go, ooh, you know. Yeah, you can, you, you feel it. You feel it happening. Yeah. And you're thinking, yeah. oh, I know what's going to happen now. But instead of getting does. a crutch or like yeah. propping himself up against the wall, he decides he's, he's done for. He can't get he out is, He's done for. For him, the war is over. And Exactly. <laughs> and, um, yeah. You know, the Canadian guy to to his to his um credit is like, no, I don't know what you mean. And he's like, We both know what's gonna happen here. And like I'm like, yes, we do know what's gonna happen here. This is yeah, this is a, yeah. a very common trope. And he basically he goes, I'm gonna blow up the bomb. And he's like, Okay. Yeah, but he said but he says, Show me what to yeah. do. Oh no, that's we've missed out a really important plot point. <laughs> yeah. Wait, sorry. They called an important pop. They're going to det- they before before the the infected guy breaks the guy's ankle. Yeah. Which seems when when I say this that sounds really really weak and it, it is a weak plot. Yeah. So th- th- there's sort of like a montage of them hunting for an alarm clock. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bizarre. To, to detonate the bomb? Yeah, they obviously need that. Yeah. 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 So you know that's the easiest way of detonating this big pile of amatol. Yeah. Um, is is an alarm clock, and they happily thank God they find one. That's it. And he says to it, doesn't he? They have like this discussion about the horrors of war, 
and he says, like, his friend put a stick grenade in his mouth and pulled yeah. the cord. Like, like during, how big's his mouth? During the, during the shelling at the Somme, <laughs> Somme yeah. he puts a, a grenade in his mouth. Yeah. I'm like, that's very the visceral. Pin. But... And we, were, we were racking our brains what grenade that could be, and we thought the only one you'd get away with is a German egg grenade. Mm. But it's like... <laughs> but you know the, they were thinking about a st- stick grenade. The, the mental image is someone trying to kill yeah. <laughs> mouth it's so stupid he's like oh, how big was the... the guy's mouth yeah and then he says i picked the teeth out of my chin for days and we're like what <laughs> that's such a weird thing to say so the the alarm clock is broken in the um in the struggle with the infected guy that's that breaks it. his ankle yeah um so that's that's why um oberleutnant good german has to remain yes. behind <laughs> he does yeah to, to to detonate but, but, the, the bomb. The bomb. But he says to the Canadian tunneler, he's like, you need to show me what to do. And you and me, <laughs> we were just like, what? Because the dialogue's just sometimes a bit weird. Yeah, it's kind of like clipped. They sort of like jump. Yeah. And he, and he goes, you put the two wires together. And he <laughs> says it in the most matter, matter of fact way. He's like, you just put the two wires together. You put the two wires together. <laughs> like, yeah, in his what? New York accent. Yeah. In his Winnipeg, New York it's accent. so weird. So the tunnel leaves him, yeah, yeah. basically, and He's, we have a lovely like little shot of the of Oberleutnant Good German like looking at his his family, his few pictures of his family. Yeah, yeah. He's not mentioned. Like, oh. He's never mentioned them before. Yeah, that's the first time you realise that he has a family. Yeah, it's like, oh shit, the kids. <laughs> the kids yeah, I think of the children. The tunnel is sort of heads off, and he's laying a wire mm-hmm. down a down a tunnel. Yeah. And he's attacked again by the uh, the vermicelli mob. Yeah, it's a bigger one this time, isn't it? It's, it's one, only yeah. one. You only get like yeah. four. Well, they can't afford movie. that many, Robbie. Come on. It's just extras. <laughs> Come on. Actors cost money, you know. Yeah, they do. Unfortunately, they need to be fed and paid. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. do. But this one's a big one, isn't it? Um, this is like he is a big the one. Dolph Ludgren. Oof. Yeah, he looked like Sting. I don't know why. <laughs> you look at the movie. Bit, yeah. He just looked like I don't know why. Mister Tunnelo gets him. Um. And then loads of vermicelli noodles come out of his face. Mm. Loads. Yeah. But lot. then I thought the movie would say like, oh, when they leave the host body, like they attack. No, they kind of just like, like they just, just don't re- do revert to the vermicelli state of just being wet noodles. It's not that scary, is it? You know, it's not like they're jumping from human to human, like the thing or something. No, like they're, they're only passed by like... Um, passing of fluids that's it much like coronavirus mm. um cool maybe they would <laughs> heard it here first trench 11 invented no. <laughs> no um so there's the the only other scene of note really is the scene with the doctor oh yes and reiner yes yes and they're having a chat about things and his sort of like pseudo nazism comes mm-hmm. out will be the dominant race and all that. It's a what bit it's jarring. That's saying my only real criticism of the movie really is that scene. Yeah. It's like it's a it's a little bit off. And it, while he's doing that, he's sort of like playing with a a brass instrument thing. And the doctor And he didn't do anything with it. No. Well it turns out that's for the gramophone apparently. What the f- <laughs> And he goes, Oh, it's for the gramophone. I rather thought you were going to torture me. Yeah. And he goes, oh no, I'm going to torture. Yeah, and then it, it cuts, it cuts, cuts away. away. So the horror gore movie, there's barely any gore in we it. We don't see any torture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the next time we see the doctor, he's dead off screen. He's, he's like missing an eye. Yeah, missing that's it. Yeah. And we thought like, oh, is he going to infect him? You know, is there going to yeah, be that would have? Yeah, you know, is he going to like hold some vermicelli up to him? Yeah. Like trying to like spoon feed him some vermicelli. Taste this <laughs> sort of thing. Try these noodles. Would you like would you like some noodle soup? <laughs> try these try this pot noodle for me. <laughs> yum yum. Um no, but it's yeah. just weird. And then it well, getting back to like Tunneler Boy, he then is just running through the complex and he's got to blow mm. it up and it starts exploding and that you know It does. And then he kind of gets out. Well, there's a, a there's a super um Underwhelming climax. Yeah, though, isn't sorry. There? Yeah, the really underwhelming climax. It was so that underwhelming that you forgot about it. Forgot to, to mention it. So he's running away, and and Reiner's like trying to get out as well. So that instead of having a fight, he kind of just shoots, says like shoots him in the in the leg or something. Yeah, he, he sort of like shoots the tunnel in the leg. 
Mm. And he's like, get up, get up. Ah, ha, ha. And you're going mad. And then he's you like, know. get on your knees, laughing. <laughs> After getting up. And then, <laughs> and then he shoots him in like the, the hand. And, and oh. the doctor, the Reiner then like boasts to like the one other German soldier left in, in the bunker because all the others have disappeared somewhere. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And he's like, look at that. Wasn't that a good shot? And I'm like, is, is this the climax? Who cares? <laughs> Get out of this train bunker, it's gonna explode. Anyway, as as the bunker's exploding, so like the doctor's overpowered and he there's a struggle, and he eventually sort of like falls on his little vials of the, no- the noodle infection. monsters, yeah, over there. The noodle monsters, and it ends yeah. up in his eye, of course it does. Yeah, and he's screaming like it's the worst thing in the world. It, well, it, it wouldn't be great. Yeah, not it? nice. You lost an eye. Yeah. But then Tunnel gets out and nothing else happens just, to him. Yeah, the the bunker starts yeah. collapsing and the, the tunnel is just sort of like just. You know, we assume that he become like the mega baddie evil monster have to overcome. You never see him. Yeah, you, you never know, see him again. Like, what the fuck was the point in the climax of the movie if nothing's going to happen? It was a weak climax. I've, I've seen worse movies than this with better climaxes. I've seen movies that you know are meant to be bad have better climaxes than this. <laughs> It was such a cop out ending. It really was a cop out. And and then he looks up at the sky and he sees his girlfriend and it cuts to the credits. He sort of like has a vision, but the the vision is sort of like of of the the French yeah. girlfriend, but she's not looking at the camera, so she's not looking at him. She's kind of looking into like the middle distance past him. Yeah, <laughs> looking at the looking at the tree line over his head or something. And I thought I thought that's so odd. Like are we is. It, are we going to have like one of those scenes where like a fist like punches out of the ground and grabs him and it's and it's um, Reiner. it's Ryan yeah. back infected. from the dead no that's your film and that's it Matt have you got anything any any final thoughts yeah I think it lacked direction and plot from beginning to end but a good laugh, and um, we'd recommend it for Halloween night. There's definitely worse things to do <laughs> with the Halloween night. Yeah, I mean, if only to see the vermicelli. I mean, yeah, the, the vermicelli Jerry's. And the Bergman. The Bergman and the vermicelli. What more could you want? Sounds like a very trendy restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like German uh, Vietnamese fusion. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it does sound tasty. So definitely tasted in this film was <laughs> yes so that's that's 90 minutes guys if if you want to watch trench 11 death trench and be thoroughly under scared it's, it's 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 uh it's not shit but it is underwhelming sort of movie couple of beers don't take it seriously you know as it's halloween there are worse movies yeah um it's it's readily available so if you if you're looking for a, a a bespoke World War One horror. Oh movie. yes, yeah. and you there aren't many of them you, around, are there? No, and you you don't want to watch Death Watch again. Then no. Trench Eleven is the film possibly for you. It is. How many pumpkins out of ten we're going to give it? It's Halloween. Four. <laughs> Four pumpkins out of ten. Four pumpkins with Brody helmets. <laughs> Amazing. Out Four of, little pickle hal- pickle helped pumpkins. So we we went into it expecting. Um, a shit horror film. Okay. Well, we were overwhelmed by the guns and then we were underwhelmed by everything else. Yes. That's a good um, way to point it. Yeah. So, and that never really happens <laughs> yeah. in historical films. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this Halloween special. Happy Halloween, everyone. Happy Halloween. Yeah. Follow us on Twitter at Fighting on Film. And let us know what you thought of it. For another Fighting on Film, this is Robbie signing off. This is Matt. Thanks for listening, guys. Thank you very much. Have a good one.